appropriate for us to begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings, for your goodness to us. We ask for you to lead and guide, open our eyes, help us to see these things that are necessary in order for us to uh, be able to have good, healthy relationships with others. And uh, we ask for you to work out your perfect will and way. And we thank you for doing so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that was a perfectly timed interruption. So it reminds me that my phone was not on silent. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, Yes, uh, just if there's anybody new, just let you know how we usually run this. We uh, will usually begin with a presentation on a particular topic. And uh, many of you might have seen the, the announcement that went out that we're going to be looking at sphere of action and boundaries. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And when we're done with the presentation, then we're just going to open things up for questions and answers. And so uh, that's how we're going to go. Let me share my screen. All right. So God has, we have a sphere of action. God has a sphere of action. Each individual has a sphere of action. And the, where God has a sphere of action, he takes control, and he takes for responsibility for all that he does and all that he allows within that sphere of action. And God has also created intelligent creatures, which we are, <laughs> and we have our own sphere of action. And in that sphere of action, we are given self-government. God has created us so that we would govern ourselves. And therefore, we have personal responsibility for what we do within our own sphere of action. And God has no responsibility for what happens in an individual's own sphere of action. Because that, own, that sphere of action is under their own control, not his. And that's, a, I think, a misconception that many individuals have. They think that he's got control of everything. Well, if he gives us freedom, and he gives us freedom to govern ourselves, then where he gives us the freedom to govern ourselves, he does not have now the freedom to govern us from the inside. Now, we're, we'll, we'll tease this out and come to understand it a little bit more fully uh, this evening. Uh, but um, where God creates, gives us the freedom to govern ourselves, he does not take back that freedom. An individual sphere of action, where does it reside? What, what is the extent of an individual sphere of action? Well, in reality, the one sphere of action is completely within one's own mind. That sphere of action does not extend outside of your mind. It does not extend to your body. The mind can never be forced. It can never be controlled from the outside. But as many of us have understood by personal experience, the body can be forced. The body can be uh, manipulated from the outside, and but it's the mind where we have our individual sphere of action. The individual sphere of action does not extend to the body. Now, from the mind, you control the body, but if there's no communication between the two, then you're not going to be able to control it. And 
others can take the body and do things to it and control it and make it uh, captive or other things of that nature, but nobody from the outside can come in and control the mind by force. So while not, God is not responsible for how others operate within the, our, their own sphere of action, you and I are not responsible for what happens in someone else's sphere of action either. We are only responsible for what we do inside our own sphere of action. So what somebody else thinks, what somebody else believes, is completely within their sphere of action. And what someone else says or what someone else does comes from within their sphere of action. And so what someone else thinks, what they believe, what they say, and what they do, that is their own responsibility. And God himself does not enter into that sphere of action and take over no matter how bad the problem inside may be, because that's not his sphere of action. He created us with personal responsibility, with self-government, and again, how he created us to govern ourselves, he's not going to come in and take over that governance by force from the outside. He created us perfectly. <clears throat> In creation, God said it was good. And so how he created us was good, and God does not need to take that back and revoke it. So he respects how he created us, and he does not go against his creation. Now, when I try to enter into God's sphere of action, when I try to control what is under his control, but not under my control, it doesn't work very well. And it results in stress. And when I try to enter into someone else's sphere of action, trying to control what's under their control, that doesn't work very good either. You might say, well, what's an example of getting into God's sphere? Well, we'll get into more of it later, but uh, for example, trying to control time. And then as time is getting away from you, trying to rush and push and so on and so forth, that's one way that we step, we try to get out of our sphere and get into God's sphere and try to control what's under his control. And how do we try to control what's under in other people's sphere? Well, have you ever wanted to control what somebody else believed? Did you ever want to control how somebody else responded to you? and how they said things and so on, well, that's getting into somebody else's sphere. Now, in both cases, either where I am trying to control what is in God's sphere or whether I'm try trying to control what's in somebody else's sphere, I'm trying to control what's not under my control because of a belief, a misconception, a deception that we were born with where I believe that I'm God. But I'm a selfish God. And so a selfish God breaks boundaries. A, a selfish God does not respect boundaries. And as a selfish God, I really have no boundaries for myself. Um, sorry, I have boundaries only for myself. I really don't have boundaries for others. In other words, I try to keep others out of my space. I try to, try to keep them out of my uh, you know, my actions, my words, my thoughts, my beliefs, and other things of that nature, but I freely try to enter into theirs and control that which is under their control only. And what happens when I try to get into somebody else's fear? Well, conflict and stress are the results of getting into somebody else's sphere of action. Now, everyone was created again with freedom to govern themselves in their own sphere. And guess what? <laughs> Everyone resists being governed or controlled by others. So when somebody seeks to control somebody else, 
by trying to enter their in, into their sphere of action, that other individual is going to resist that intrusion. They're going to resist that intrusion. And conflict is the result. Now, when we evaluate this, is it proper to resist somebody intruding into your own sphere of action? The answer is yes, absolutely. And, uh, and, and the reason that boundaries can be perfectly good, and in fact, in many cases are necessary, is because there is this situation and there are these situations where individuals try to get into somebody else's sphere of action. And boundaries are appropriate in order to maintain an individual's own sphere of action. And so it is natural. God created you to govern yourself. He created you to govern your own sphere of action and for nothing and no one to come in and to take it over for you without any permission or anything of that nature, right? So nobody can force you as far as your sphere of action is concerned from the outside. And, and so since God has created you that way, it is natural for you to resist that intrusion. It is right for that intrusion to be resisted. But why you resist it and how you resist it plays into whether the boundaries can be good or the boundaries can be bad. And we're going to talk about that later. Right? Um, so is it wrong to resist? No, it's not wrong to resist. Is it wrong to get into somebody else's sphere of action? Yes, it's wrong to get into somebody else's sphere of action. All right, somebody just mentioned that my voice is cutting out a lot. Is that others' experience as well? No. Okay, all right, so it's their connection. No. All right. I just wanna make sure I've got a, I've got a second internet option if this one's not working well. <laughs> all right, <clears throat> so in reality, you can never enter into someone else's sphere of action. You can't. Because they were not created for you to be able to enter into their sphere. And no one else can enter into your sphere of action. It, it can't happen. Uh, and it can't be forced. But it sure feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> Many times it sure feels like it happens. So what's going on there? where it seems like somebody is getting into your sphere of action and, and uh, it feels like you're being forced or it feels like you're being manipulated. What's going on there? Well, if I believe that someone else has and controls what I need, for example, let's say that I believe that I need somebody else's acceptance. I need somebody else's approval. I need somebody else to understand me. I need them to be in harmony with me and so on. Then what I will do is I will bind myself to them so that I can receive from them what I need. And what do I do in return? Well, then I begin to modify what I think. I begin to modify how I speak and how I act according to how I believe that they would have me think, speak, and act. So then I can continue to obtain from them that which I need. Right? You got that? I'm, I'm going to mention it again because this is an important fact, an important part. Nobody else can come in and control and manipulate you from the outside. Manipulation is something that we allow somebody else to do, and we actually modify ourselves <clears throat> in relation to another person. Because we believe that they have and possess what we need, whether it's acceptance or proof, approval or belonging or understanding or harmony or security or 
truth or other things of that nature, if we believe that they have what we need, we will bind ourselves to them. And then we will begin to modify how we think, speak, and act according to what we think they would like in order for us to still be able to receive those things that we believe we need from them, like acceptance and approval and so on. Now, do you need acceptance? Well, yes, of course. Do you need approval? Yes, you do. Do you need belonging? Yes, you do. Do you need understanding to be understood? Yes, you do. <clears throat> uh, so how is it, where is it that we're supposed to get acceptance and belonging and harmony and security and other things of that nature? Well, it's from God. God's the source of it. And so in reality, we are created so that we would come to God and get all of those things that we need from him, our harmony, security, and belonging, and acceptance, and approval, and everything like that. And then other relationships are there for us to give to, to give, to accept them, to approve, uh, of, you know, to pass on that approval, to uh, be a place of belonging for them, to be secure for them, to, um, to understand them, to listen to them, and so on. That's the purpose for, for other relationships. And when I have that turned around, so that I see them as the source that I need of my belonging and my acceptance and so on, then I'm going to bind myself to them. So if you need, for example, your spouse to give you words of affirmation, if you need your children to uh, respect you for your sake, if you need your boss to be good and kind to you <laughs> and not give you too much uh, work and so on and so forth, if you need something from them, you need them to give you a word of commendation and so on. If you need that from them, then you bind yourself to them and then you can be manipulated and controlled by them, not because they can enter into your sphere of action because they can't, but it's that you modify how you act and speak and think according to what you think they need from you so that you can continue to get from them what you need. Have you ever, or you ever heard that phrase, I am not what I am. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Yeah. I'm not what I am. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Well, that kind of goes into this, this idea that we will modify ourselves based upon what we perceive others want from us in order that we might continue to receive what we want from them. If we don't see that they have anything that we need, then we won't bind ourselves to them. We won't see them as something that we need. We can freely let them go. If it was somebody in mainland China somewhere that you didn't know of, you wouldn't bind yourself to them, and it wouldn't matter what they thought and how they, you know, how they express themselves or other things of that nature because they're not a source for you. They don't possess what you need. And, but the moment that you believe that they are a source, and they do, then you bind yourself to them, and you're stuck in this, this situation. And this is all the result of a lie that I believe that they possess what I need, and they control what I need. And so, therefore, I submit myself to them. I modify how I behave and so on, and what I think according to what I think they want, so I can continue to get from them what I think I need. And, uh, and so it's, and, and this goes into every relationship, whether it's parent-child, whether it's spouse, whether it is sibling, whether it is work relationships, and so on, it goes into all of them. Now, when <clears throat> we try to control what others think and what they believe, for example, when we try to control what they think of us. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where, where somebody misunderstood you? 
and they thought of you differently because of how they understood you and you try to clear up that misunderstanding so that they could think of you the right way. Well, that's sometimes trying to control what others think or what they believe, right? What do they believe about a particular topic? There might be important topics to you. Um, and, uh, you know, it might relate to, uh, let's see, what are some, some big topics out there? Well, you know, the... <laughs> the right for choice or the right for life or uh red or blue or donkeys or elephants or you know there, there's all sorts of things that are out there and we like to control others um recently there was a big game that i was told about i forgot about these things but i was somewhere and they said well oh, the big game's coming on today that was yesterday that's right and, uh, you know, so one person wants somebody to believe in their team and somebody else wants somebody else to believe in their team. And, and if you want to if you want to control others and what they believe, now you're outside of your sphere of action. And when you control when you try to control what they say and what they do, you're outside of your sphere of action. And trying to control all of these things is going to result in conflict and it's going to result in damaged relationships. And if you have ever been a parent that has tried to control your children uh, in the wrong way, which most of us do, then you're going to end up with damaged relationships. There's going to be lots of conflict, and it's just not going to look very pretty. Now, it's not only in the direction of interpersonal relationships, but it's also when we start spacing out into God's uh, sphere of action. You know, so what does God control? Well, he controls space and he controls time and he controls circumstances and resources and environment and people and possessions and so on. And then there's also things like reputation and other things similar. And when I try to control these things, then I'm trying to enter into God's sphere of action and control what is actually only under his control. Now, I see all of these as problems and kind of like little fires or maybe big fires that are burning very hot and that are threatening to burn me. And so, of course, I want to control all these things so that I don't get burned. But can you control what's outside of you? Well, the answer is no. So if you can't control what's outside of you and it threatens you, well, the result of that is stress, because you're going to fail to control what's outside of you. You will be under threat, and that is going to bring you stress. And fear as well is going to be a result of that. Now, when someone else says or does something to me, what they say and what they do originates in their own sphere of action, which I have no responsibility. but if I believe that I am God, which is, you know, kind of our baseline, that's the foundation of sinful fallen human nature, that we believe that we're God. It's that lie that the enemy told Eve, Eve in the Garden of Eden that we've bit, bit into and, and then passed on by inheritance from generation to generation. Now, if they say what they say and they do, which I don't have any responsibility for, if I now believe that I am God, now, and I try to control what they think and say and do, when I try to control those things that are in that inside their sphere of action, then I take responsibility for what they say and they do to me. Now I take it personal. It becomes a personal offense to me. I can't help taking it personal because that's the natural response to thinking that I'm God and that they're in my sphere of action and that their sphere of action is under my control. So as I take those things, um, I will take it personally and I will, you know, I will take personal what they say and what they do and so on as if what came out of their sphere and originated in their sphere of action is actually something that is in my sphere and, are, and is my issue. That's not the case. But even God himself does not enter into someone else's sphere of action. 
And neither does he take any responsibility for what others do in their sphere of action. And he recognizes that what they do and what they say and what they believe is under their own control and it's their own responsibility. So guess what? He doesn't take personal <clears throat> what they say and what they do as if it was his responsibility. Now, does he take it? Does he hurt for them because they're his children and because he, ha he loves them and so on? Yes, absolutely. But he does not take responsibility himself for what they say and what they do and what they think. And uh, he loves them. He wants to set them free. He just can't enter their sphere of action and fix the problem for them because he doesn't have access there. So the question is, how is he going to fix a problem where he has no access to fix it? Because he doesn't have access in the sphere of action. All right. So imagine with me that you are driving off in the middle of Timbuktu or somewhere, upper Saskatchewan or whatever it is, um, uh, Yukon, Alaska. Somewhere, you're in the middle of nowhere. There's no cell service. There's no nothing. Your vehicle breaks down, and it's a bad breakdown. And you have no other way of getting back to civilization and getting back to home other than your broken down vehicle, which obviously is not working for you right now. And But near where you broke down, you find that there is an armless mechanic. And that armless mechanic comes to help you out. And he can diagnose the problem. And what he does is he offers to coach you through the repair process. He knows how to fix it, but he doesn't have arms to do the fixing. So he needs your arms and your hands to do the work. He tells you what to remove and in what order to remove it and how to remove it, but you do the work. He explains to you what the problem is and shows you where it is and then guides you in fixing it, but you do the work. And he talks you through how to put everything back together again, but you do the work. And in the end, you start your car and it's running again. So in this analogy, God is the armless mechanic and you are the one who does the work. Now, it isn't that God doesn't have any arms. He does, and his arms are very strong. But since the problem that needs to be fixed is inside of our sphere of action, God can't just reach in and fix it for us. It's as if he has no arms in that space because it's in our sphere. And it's only we who can fix it because it's within our sphere of action, but there's still a problem. And the problem is we don't know how to fix it and we don't have the power to do so. So what God does is he offers to guide us. He offers to give us instruction in how to fix the problem. But not only that, he offers to give us the power that's necessary so that the mechanisms that he created us with, those things that we use in our self-government, <clears throat> excuse me, those things that we use in our self-government, that those become empowered so that they now function because they were dysfunctional because of sin and sinful nature. But it's we who must do the work. Now, if we sit around twiddling our thumbs, expecting him to do the work, then it's not going to happen because he doesn't have access to fix it where the problem is. And if we go to work trying to fix it ourselves, well, it's not going to happen either because we don't know how to fix it and we don't have the power and the ability to be able to do so. So it's only together. It's only with God working in his sphere and us working in our sphere, cooperating together, where the problem inside of us can be fixed. Now, Again, while everything that someone says and someone does comes from within their own sphere of action, for which they alone are responsible, 
Yet, what they say and what they do has an impact upon others. It has an influence. You can't help it. Now, it's true. Again, God will never enter into an individual sphere of action and control how they govern themselves. Never. But in the context of sinful nature, which is destructive, God must intervene where necessary in order to save and to bring about a good outcome. So where is God going to intervene? Where is God not going to intervene? God is not going to intervene in the individual's own sphere of action. But God will intervene in his sphere of action outside of their sphere, where the saying and the doing comes out. Now, God is the only source of power, and everything that functions does so with his power. And there are laws by which everything functions, and laws are channels through which God's power is given to a particular function or a particular process. And before sin ever came into the picture, back in Lucifer, Satan days up in heaven, there was no need for God to intervene in any situation whatsoever, because everything created functioned the way that he created it to function, and it was good. But after sin and rebellion entered, now God must intervene. And he must intervene in order to bring about righteousness and a good outcome. So, there is no intelligent creature under the influence of sinful nature that has unlimited access to God's power. None. Not Satan. Not any human being. And God must limit the power that they have access to but he does so in order to work out good through the midst of their evil and sinful nature. Now, while God will never control what someone thinks or believes, right? He will never control the cause that's in their own sphere of action. He does control what they can accomplish. He controls the effect. So, God is in control of all effects, though he is not in control of all causes. I mean, he's not in control of all causes. If he has given you the ability to govern yourself, he does not control how you govern yourself. He does not control what you think, what you believe, what you initiate as far as what you would say or what you would do. But he does control whether you would actually be able to say it, get it out of your mouth, not think it, but get it out of your mouth, and whether you would be able to actually do it, whatever you were planning on doing. Now, fire has no power of its own. It's God's power by which fire burns. And yes, God gives power to the fire through predictable laws. But God can limit that power when he so chooses, as was the case with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Animals have no power of their own. It is by God's power which they live and they do their stuff. And God gives that power to animals through predictable laws. But God can limit the power when he so chooses, as was the case with Daniel in the lion's den. And people, people have no power of their own. It's by God's power by, that they act and live and speak and so on. And, and God gives that power to people through predictable laws, but he can limit that power when he so chooses, as was the case when King Jeroboam called for the arrest of the prophet that spoke against the idolatrous altar that he had built and the his bringing most of Israel away from the true worship of God. Well, when he called for the arrest of that prophet, <clears throat> his hand withered up, and he couldn't even bring it back to himself anymore. It was stuck. He could no longer use or control that hand. Why? Because it was by God's power that he used it. 
It was not until the prophet prayed for him that God resumed giving King Jeroboam power by which he could control his hand once more. And bullets. Bullets have no power of their own. It is God's power by which they move. And yes, God gives that power to bullets through predictable laws, but God can limit that power when he so chooses. And when I started my trauma surgery rotation in uh, Loma Linda University, they were still talking about that case of this woman. What happened? Well, she broke up with her boyfriend, and he was not exactly happy with her about that. And so he wanted revenge. And so as she was in a particular part of the, of the town, stopped at a red light, he walked up next to her and pulled out his gun and shot her point blank in the head through the window. And as she's sitting, she's driver, so the bullet comes in here and the bullet comes out here, right? Now a little bit higher here, a little bit lower there because he was standing a little bit higher than her. And uh, you know that there's valuable territory between point A and point B called the brain. Well, she was, uh, you know, 911 was called, ambulance got her, rushed her to the emergency department. Uh, trauma team was there ready for her, got her, you know, stabilized and so on, and, and shuttled her off quickly to the CT scanner so that they could see what damage was there so that the neurosurgeon would know whether they could do anything about it, and, you know, how well or poorly this is probably going to turn out. Well, they were shocked as they were there in the CT scanner and the images were starting to come up because they didn't see any damage to the brain whatsoever. None. In fact, what they saw in the images was that the bullet came inside into her, uh, her head on this side, but there, it's, it's pretty thin before you get the skull over here and it's the thinnest part of the skull, the easiest part for it to crack and you'd get to the brain. Anyways, the bullet went right in there. And once it got to the skull, it turned. And then it tracked along underneath her skin, right? Underneath her scalp and everything and went around the back of her head and around this side, all the way to the other side and out that side. Wow, wow. I mean, wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, truly. And, and the trauma team was still talking about it and everybody was just like, wow, we can, you know, even the ones that don't believe in God and they're, you know, whatever, they're just like, well, oh no, it's really, really interesting, unexplainable. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can only imagine the angel that was commissioned <laughs> And it let that bullet go in, actually this side, let that bullet go in and move around and go around so that there was no damage in between. You know, wow, amazing, yes. But, 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 fire that only burns by God's power under God's laws has burned many martyrs to ashes. And animals who live and function using God's power have killed many other martyrs. And other hands that have moved under the direction of man, but by the power of God, have been used to accomplish great evil in this world. And many, many other bullets that have moved by the power of God through predictable laws have resulted in the injury and death of many, many people. Many. Now we love the stories where God where God saved people from external problems. But the real deal is the transformation of the heart, even when there is no external deliverance. One of the greatest stories of deliverance is that of John the Baptist. He questioned whether Jesus was the Christ. He did. He sent disciples to ask Jesus if he was the one. When they brought the report to, of what Jesus was doing to John, even though he himself never saw any of Jesus' miracles and his working and that kind of stuff, he believed. He believed. 
And that was enough. That was enough. To be delivered from unbelief to belief will save you forever. Being saved from a physical fire or a lion's or a bullet will not. So what if God needed to allow the pain and suffering so that he could bring you to the point of delivering you from unbelief? Would it be worth it or would it not? It is only by God's love that he allows the suffering. You and I are like ants. We have a very limited perspective and capacity. We're like ants stuck in the grass. You can barely see to the next blade. (laughs) But God sees everything from eternity past to eternity future. And he knows everyone. He loves each one with a love that would surrender his own life for theirs. And knowing everything. He intervenes within his own sphere of action as he knows best for his entire creation. And he gives us promises that are absolutely sure. One of those is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. With this promise, we can know that everything that happens to us will only be permitted if it will work out for good. That's it. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us no temptation, that also means no trial, no test, no suffering, no pain, has overtaken you except such as is common to men. You're not alone. Others have suffered it too. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted, who will not allow you to suffer, who will not allow you to be tried. Beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, the suffering, the trial, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to hear it. Notice, it doesn't say make the way of escape that you may not suffer it. But make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's right, to bear it. He who walked in our flesh, he who lived our life, he who experienced our sufferings, he who became our sin, who paid our penalty, and who understands firsthand our temptations and weaknesses, it is he that is the one who filters and measures everything that gets to us, everything. Yes, <clears throat> there are a lot of bad, bad things that are outside of us. Absolutely. I mean, uh, come on, there are problems. And people have problems, and animals have problems, and possessions have problems, and the environment has problems, and the circumstances are problems, and there's resource problems, and time problems, and space problems, and so on. We've got all these problems that are around us. And, and the enemy wants nothing less than to use each of these external issues to burn us. He wants to turn the heat up so hot that it'll burn us up and just destroy us. And here we are trying to control all these things that are outside of our sphere of action so that we don't get burned. But can we control what's outside of our sphere of action? Well, no. So how successful are we going to be at keeping ourselves from getting burned? Well, we're going to fail every time. Now, does that then mean that we have to live in fear for the rest of our lives because we're now subject to this stuff for the rest of our lives? The answer is no. There's a solution. Now, I don't have to face these things alone and protect myself from them because Jesus surrounds me with his presence. And he filters everything that comes to me from the outside. He measures it all, and he allows through only that which is needed. Well, needed for what? I'll talk about that in just a minute. I like this quote. I want to share it with you. It says, the Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him 
falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. Well, how can we say that? Well, if, if, if everything has to get through Christ first, well, then guess what? It doesn't get to us unless he says, okay. So then we can say whatever comes to him or comes to me comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except uh, by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. He is an intelligent force field that surrounds us with his own presence, and he will only allow that through, which will work out for our good. Why was it that that bullet did not go through that young woman's brain because it could not have worked out for good. It wouldn't have worked out for good. And God had a testimony to give not just to her, but to many, many others through her story. It would be a different story if her boyfriend had, ex-boyfriend had come and stood by the car and couldn't pull his arm up to get the gun to point at her. It would be another story if he had pulled up the gun and tried to pull the trigger, but it wouldn't move, or he had pulled the trigger, but no bullet came out, or he <clears throat> pulled the trigger and a bullet came out and went in a different direction than it was supposed to. It'd be, those are all be different stories. It's an entirely different story when it went in this side and went out of that side, and it didn't touch any valuable territory in between. No an undeniable testimony that will result in the salvation of souls, perhaps her own and maybe the boyfriend that, or the ex-boyfriend that did it. We don't know. But we know that it will work out for good. Now, there's a problem that's inside of me, inside of each of us. And that's the problem of sinful nature. It's a character out of harmony with God. And that problem is like a misshaped and impure metal. And the only way that that metal is going to be turned into something pure and useful is for it to be melted, purified, and remolded. But in order for that to happen, you've got to have heat. Got to have heat. You've got to have a lot of heat. And depending on the metal and the impurities that are in it, determines how much heat is necessary in order to melt that, to be able to purify it, and then remold it into something that it needs to be. So there's all this fire outside, but the fire outside needs to get inside so that this can be melted and purified. <clears throat> Where does the fire come from? I want to specify this. Fire comes from those things that are your sources. <clears throat> if, for example, if it was somebody's house in the middle of Uzbekistan, then that burned down. Well, that doesn't bother you. Really. That doesn't that doesn't affect you as a fire that's going to get at you. It's when your house burns down. It's not when a a husband is taking advantage of a wife in sub-Saharan Africa that it affects you. It's when your spouse takes advantage of you. It's not when the environment goes haywire in the other hemisphere and there's a, a uh, you know, an earthquake or a volcano or a hurricane or a typhoon or other things like that and people are lost and, and so on. It, that doesn't really hit you hard until it comes home. And it's in your neighborhood, and it's in your town, and it's in your state, and it's in your home. It's not when it affects other people's resources that you don't know. It's when it's your resources, and so on. It's when these things are yours that the fire gets to you. And what does Jesus do? 
<clears throat> Jesus offers to surround us with his very own presence. And he will serve as the filter. He will serve as the filter so that that fire that's outside can only get to you by his permission. Now, our measure of success is to keep it out. That's our measure of success. Keep out the fire, keep out the fire. I don't want to get hot. His measure of success is to let as much fire in as is necessary in order for that problem to be purified. So if we have God as the one who is filtering the fires from outside, then <clears throat> he will let more heat in than we ever would, than we ever would. But it's for our purification. It's for our purification. Now, what happens over time with those fires in that purification process? <laughs> well, if I get burned over and over and over again with possessions, the car gets messed up. The, car, the house has problems. The what you name it gets damaged and broken and, and, and you know, and, and burned or whatever it might be. When we come to recognize that we don't possess anything, none of it is ours. And we truly come to the position where we enter into a stewardship rather than an ownership. Now, nothing belongs to me. Everything belongs to God then if the house burns down and the car is wrecked, then it was God's house and God's car. And it's not my fire anymore. It's not my fire anymore. It's not my problem because it's not mine. Now, when people are still angry and ugly and manipulative and, and forceful and all that kind of stuff, well, if I with experience over time, have been burned over and burned over and burned over and over and over again because I'm depending upon people. And now I come to the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit is working with me, and, and the Lord is, is, is striving with me as well and presenting to me as truth. Now I come to understand that, oh, hang on, people don't possess what I need. It's God who has what I need. I, relationships are not for me, but human relationships are not for me to go and take from and depend upon another individual. Human relationships are for me to give what I have come and taken from God. Well, when that gets fixed in my life, guess what? Somebody else can be burning up and it's their problem. It's not my problem anymore. Now, I can hurt for them, I can yearn for them, I can love them in the midst of that, but I don't take it personal because it's not my problem, it's their problem. They're the one that's burning up, I don't have to burn up. And, and the environment and, and so on, all these different things, when we finally come to realize we don't have anything, we don't control anything, nothing is under our control, we let him control it, we let him possess it, we're simply the steward to respond with him. Guess what? We can finally get to the point where there's no other fire that can burn us from the outside. It's all been burned away. There's nothing else from the outside that can burn us. Nothing else that can pressure us, that can cause us to go against what we thought and what we believed and so on. That's the freedom that God wants to bring us to. There's only one fire that would afflict us at that time. And that is if it appeared that God was our enemy. And then in the fire of God appearing to be our enemy, not that he is, we would only hold on by faith. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That will be the experience of a small group of people at the end of time. Now, we've got these concepts. Now let's pull it into a relationship context where you have two individuals that are occupying the same space. 
You've got two people that live in the same home. One likes things clean and orderly. The other one keeps things dirty and a perpetual state of disorder. Now, how do the two, these two things come together and how does it relate in the matter of sphere of action? Because you have each individual, this one has their sphere of action, this one has their sphere of action, this one has, takes their sphere of action and uses it to be clean and orderly, and this one takes their sphere of action and uses it to be dirty and distant. So how do you manage these two if you're the clean and orderly one, or if you're the dirty and disorderly, and clean wants to clean your disorder, your dirty, and disorderly wants to disorder your orderliness, <laughs> right? I mean, the real relationship issues and struggles here. Well, first of all, whose house is it? Who owns the house? Well, the house is owned by God, not you. It's his, not yours. So who are you accountable to? Are you accountable to yourself? Are you accountable to the other individual? Well, your accountability is to God. Well, then what are you accountable for? Are you accountable for the house turning out clean and orderly when there's somebody else in there that's dirty and disorderly, but you're the clean and orderly one? Are you responsible that the house turns out clean and orderly when you have a disorderly one? Is it? All right. And the question also is, who has the delegated authority? What if the clean and orderly one is a child and the dirty disorderly one is the parent? Well, that makes a difference. Is it the parent? Is it the, it, it, are we talking spouses? Are we talking parent-child? How are we relating here? That, that makes a difference in, in all of this, right? And <clears throat> is it ever good to try to take over someone else's stewardship, to enter into their sphere of action, to, to control them so that they, they manage things the way that you would have them manage? Well, the answer is no. It's always evil to try to get into somebody else's sphere of action and try to control them, even if you're trying to control them for good. That is actually the worst evil, is to try to control somebody else for good. Because good never forces someone else, never. It always leaves them free. All right, so how do you relate in this sphere? You have a hoarder. You have a disorderly individual. And you're there in that environment, and you're the clean, orderly one. How do you relate to these two differences? Well, you have, it's not your home, and you have no responsibility for how the home turns out. You don't. You only have a responsibility for how you relate to that which is under your authority. You only have, you only, your delegated authority. You only have a responsibility for how you relate to that which is under your delegated authority. So let's, let's say that dirty disorderly is the husband of the home, clean orderly is the, the wife of the home. That's a, I mean, it's not always that case, but we'll just use that scenario. All right. <clears throat> so if the, the, the husband of the home claims the garage, and claims the living room, and claims his side of the bedroom, and claims this bathroom, and claims whatever, basically, as their space. And as the wife of the home, well, you're left the other half of the bed, and the other half of the bedroom, and this bathroom, and the kitchen, and that's your area of delegated authority. Well, then what do you do? Well, you keep your half of the bed clean and you keep your half of the room clean and you keep your bathroom clean and you keep, that's not yours, right? It's God's. And you keep the kitchen clean and you keep it clean for God. And if they enter into those spaces and they disorganize it and they make it disorderly, then you talk to God and you say, okay, go Lord, what would you have me to do about it? And if they spill over into those areas, you have no responsibility for their spilling over. You don't. And you have no responsibility for how they relate to the house. Their responsibility is their own, and their accountability is to God, not to you. And so 
<clears throat> and, and if the home ends up being destroyed because of their dirtiness and their disorderliness, well, God will hold them accountable, not you. You are simply accountable for how you relate to that which God has given you as his delegated authority in that particular situation. So you relate to things the best that you can in your particular situation. God takes that as your responsibility, and he's happy with you in that, even if the whole thing turns out disorderly and disorganized and dirty and so on because of the other individual or individuals that were living in that manner. It's not your problem. It's their problem. You might say, well, yes, I have to live with it. Well, yes. I mean, there's lots of problems that we have to live with. But if we're living with problems around us and we have a problem with the problems around us, then that means we have a problem. And it's our problem that's causing us to have a problem with that which is around us. And so that needs to be worked on, and that needs to be fixed. And when my problem that's inside of me is fixed, well, then I don't have a problem with others around me right? and, and their problems. I, I can simply be a steward of God's resources, take from him what I need, react and interact in, in ways that are Christ-like in the situation that I am, <clears throat> be cheerful as I'm picking up and cleaning up and keeping orderly whatever is is then in my particular sphere and my responsibility. And I can be happy in knowing that I am I am being faithful and, and responding to God and in, in communication and cooperation with him. And I leave them, if they're being dirty and all that kind of, I leave them to God. God can judge them. He can, he can, but he's not, he, he's the advocate. You know, we can leave them to God's mercy and his grace and, and seeking to redeem them. And perhaps our example of, you know, being nice and kind and, and cheerful and orderly in the midst of it, they might be inspired along the way. They might not. But that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is simply what we think, what we say, and what we do. We have no responsibility for what someone else thinks, what somebody else says, and what somebody else does. And when we think we do, that's when we get into all of these problems, all of these problems. So, <clears throat> um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to skip a few things here. Um, there is civil law, and civil law is appropriate. It's absolutely appropriate. There's God's law as well, and God's law is appropriate too. God's law deals with the mind. It deals with the thoughts. It deals with the intentions of the heart. It deals with sin issues. It it it, uh, it deals with um, uh, with morality. It deals with forgiveness and love and eternal realities and so on. Civil government. Civil government deals with the body. It deals with actions. It deals with crime, not sin. It deals with civility, not morality. It deals with penalties and force rather than forgiveness and love. And it, and it deals with temporal issues, things that are here and now, not things that are eternal. The, the government is not supposed to really take into, um, you know, into consideration what you consider from eternal perspectives, right? And, uh, and civil government cannot operate like God's government. What would it be like if civil law offered love and forgiveness as its motives. I mean, as the ways that it operated. Well, it just break down. It just wouldn't work. It must operate in regards to uh, force and penalties and so on. Why? Because civil law is dealing with individuals who will not be controlled by God's law. That's where civil law functions. It functions in the context where you have individuals who will not be controlled by God's law, therefore will not be moral, therefore are sinners, therefore will be likely to break into somebody else's sphere of action. Now, God's law deals with the heart to prevent you from to breaking into somebody else's sphere of action. Civil law does not care about what you think. If you are thinking that you are angry with your neighbor, the civil law could care less. It's God's law that deals with that. 
But if you say and do, and that harms your neighbor, that's where the civil law has the right to step in and do something about that. And it involves force and, and so on and so forth. So moral law was made by God himself in the and, and is the standard of government for all creation. And everyone that has moral capacity has an intelligent obligation to live and conduct themselves in harmony with the moral law. And this is because everything was created by God as part of his kingdom. And every creature is a citizen of that kingdom. <clears throat> and whether they want to acknowledge the fact or not, they are that citizen. And while God will never reach into a man's sphere of action to control where that man alone has control, man is accountable to God for how he operates within his personal sphere of action, because man does belong to God, who created him, and is indebted to God for redeeming him. And there is a judgment that will evaluate how each one handled their personal responsibility and accountability to God. But in the meantime, there is the appropriate role of civil government to fulfill, and that role is, is to restrain the outwardly harmful behaviors of those who will not be internally controlled by God's moral code. It's to restrain by warning and by the use of force the harmful actions of those under its domain that will not be controlled by love and its appeals to goodness. Now, hmm, if I have no responsibility for what someone else does in their own sphere of action, does that mean I have no responsibility to try to help them if they're deceived and destroying themselves by their own deception? The answer is no. We do have a responsibility to our brother and sister as God's physical agents to try to rescue them from self-destruction. Now, we cannot force but we can appeal. We can appeal. If they want to say, you know, if by what they say and what they do, we see that they are conducting themselves in a self-destructive manner, then we have the privilege as disciples of the one who lived to seek and save which was lost, to cooperate with him in trying to rescue our brother and sister from self-destruction. So with hearts full of love of Christ, we are to go to them to show them the love of God and to try to reason with them, to leave their self-destructive beliefs and behaviors and put their trust in Christ. If they won't listen to us, then we go find others who, are, who they respect, others whose hearts are filled with the love of Christ and who yearn for that person's salvation, and we go to them again to try to reason with them to leave their self-destructive beliefs and behaviors and to put their trust in Christ. And if they won't listen to the smaller group, then we call the entire group of believers together to surround them in love and appeal to their reason to leave those self-destructive beliefs and behaviors and put their trust in Christ. And if they reject this group appeal, then, well, we don't have an obligation anymore to chase them, right? We are released from that obligation. And we do leave them in their condition, but we still love them. We still pray for them. We still yearn for their salvation. We're still ready to embrace them whenever or if ever they turn again for help out of their self-deception. All right, now, boundaries. Let's talk about boundaries. What are healthy boundaries and where do they come from? Well, healthy boundaries are necessary. They're necessary for proper function and for proper relationships. And what they do is they keep others out of your sphere of action. And they keep you out of others' sphere of action. And proper boundaries keep you out of God's sphere of action and God already exists by proper boundaries, so he keeps himself out of your sphere of action, right? Now, there is an association between boundaries and perceptions. Boundaries are automatic, but they're automatic based upon one's perceptions. So let's say, for instance, that you perceive danger. 
Well, if you perceive that you are in danger, you can't help but put up a boundary to protect yourself. If you perceive that there's no danger, there's no need for you to put up a boundary. In this case, you know, if you had a lion that was standing in front of you with no fence, and you were in safari in Africa, and there's a lion with no fence in between you, and you're standing that close to it, well, you might think that you need to erect a boundary. If you're at a lion rescue and there's this fence in between already, well, you might feel like you're safe because, well, there's that boundary already. So if you're already protected, there's no need for your own boundary. And when you understand that Christ surrounds you with his presence, well, you can understand that you don't need to erect your own boundary when it comes to yourself because Christ is your boundary. And he will control what gets in and what doesn't get in. Now, what happens with unhealthy boundaries? Well, in unhealthy boundaries, I have a false perception and a lie that I believe. And that lie leads me to break boundaries. So I try to go out and enter into God's sphere of action. I try to get into others people's, other people's sphere of action. And I try to keep them out of my sphere, but I freely enter into theirs. And so I will break down appropriate boundaries because of this false perception. And the basis of this false perception, this lie, is the, the, the belief that I am God. So if the boundaries are to protect myself, then they will always end up being harmful. I don't care how what kind of boundaries and how you put them up if the boundaries are to protect yourself they will always end up being harmful because the motivation is selfish it's for self's sake and selfishness never turns out well in the end even though what you do in the meantime might seem good and you might say well I mean, if you don't ever put up boundaries for yourself, doesn't that just make you a floor mat or, you know, anybody can just walk over you and do whatever and all that kind of stuff. And the question is, are you your own? And the answer is no, you're not your own. You were bought at a price, a very precious, priceless price, right? You're not your own. You're his. Didn't he say, if you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me? That means that if they've done it unto you, they've done it unto him. You're precious. He feels everything that happens to you. It happens to him. In reality, you can never actually do something for yourself because you're not your own. You're not your own. Now, what about proper boundaries? Well, proper boundaries can be for your mission. Right? Jesus had a mission that was given to him by his father, and he had boundaries to protect that mission that was given to him by his father. In Luke 2 and verse 49, says, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So, you know, here he's in the temple. He's doing exactly what his father in heaven to do. His parents had wandered away for a day and lost him for three days, and now they're coming back, and Mary's chastising him. Did you not know that we were gone and we've been missing and we've been looking for you these three days? How dare you? And he said, hang on, mom, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? In essence, you don't have the right to govern my mission. That is between me and the father only. Now is his family again, and it's almost, all, you know, it's, you see it in Jesus' life. It was family, right? Jesus said to them, and who? His brothers. My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. They're saying, well, if you're anybody, if anybody's anybody, they go up to Jerusalem and they prove that they're somebody. So if you're somebody, go up to Jerusalem. They didn't believe him. You know, go up to Jerusalem. He says, well, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify of it that it works, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast, for my time is not yet fully come. You don't control my ministry. It's the Father who controls the ministry. And later, when his mother and brothers came to, you know, they didn't think he was managing the ministry well, 
he said in Matthew 12, uh, 12, 48 to 50, he says, who are, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and, bro and sister and mother, brother and sister and mother. Yeah. yeah. Boundaries, healthy boundaries. You belong to God. You don't belong to yourself. And you have no right to allow others to divert you from God's will and his plan for your life. Because you belong to him. You don't belong to them. And in Christ, you will have boundaries to protect God's will for your life. You will have boundaries to protect God's plan for your life. But as you maintain those boundaries... You will always do so with the utmost respect, and as, gen as Jesus did, with gentle firmness, very kind and gentle firmness. Now, Jesus, as our example, our perfect example, never put up boundaries to protect himself. Never, not once. He knew his father already set up a boundary for him, so he had no boundaries for himself. Hmm. John 18, 12. Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Did he put up boundaries and prevent them from doing so? No. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? He recognized they could not do this unless the father gave permission. And he submitted himself to everything that his father allowed to happen to him. Because he didn't have boundaries for himself. He trusted the boundaries that his father had for him. Do you not think, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? He knew what was happening. And he allowed it. Matthew 26, 67 to 68. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? That with a bag or over his head so he couldn't see. Did he allow them to, did he have boundaries and put it up and go, oh, you can't do that. Oh, that is so mean and angry. I'm going to oh, get you back. No, he didn't have any boundaries for himself. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. No boundaries for himself. When they had twisted the crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. No boundaries for himself. Pilate said, Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless my father said, okay. And the only power that you have is the power that my father allows you to have. They crucified him. And he had no boundaries for himself. Are there fires out there? Yes. Yes. But remember, Christ surrounds you with his presence. And nothing can get to you except by his permission. But whatever he permits, he only does so. If it will work out for good, then it won't be too much. Boundaries for his mission for your life? Yes, absolutely. With gentle firmness, kindness to others, but firmly bound. Boundaries for myself? No. Because he's my boundary. And he will decide what gets in and what doesn't. And he only allows it in if it will work out for good and it will never be too much. And we can trust him with that. Well, let's pray. And then we can get to our questions and answers. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for <clears throat> bringing some clarity to these things. I'm sure we have questions, lots of questions of application. 
how do we apply the principle in our own lives? And uh, and so, Lord, we ask for you as we as we seek to understand how to make that that application in our own lives. We ask for your wisdom. You said, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives liberally and without finding fault. And so, we thank you for being that wise God and free to give. And so, Lord, open our eyes and help us to find freedom in you. Allow the fires to burn, that they might burn out, and that. Dirty metal inside of us might be purified and remolded into the likeness of Christ so that it reflects the face of the purifier, our great Savior and God, our Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so if you're new, got questions that are posted in the chat and we also can unmute and ask questions uh, if you need that or there's a little hand thing that you can raise if you've got a question um, and uh, while you're thinking about your question I'm going to find some of the ones that were written and uh, we'll start there um, my question is about a close relative. They went against their parents and married somebody outside of their faith. <clears throat> the parents notice that uh, this relative is acting strange toward the family and spreading misinformation to others. What advice would you give to the parents on how to address it, but not to condone the behavior? What boundaries should the parents establish? All right, again, you are never responsible for what somebody else says and what somebody else does. Uh, if somebody is spreading misinformation, so if somebody else is slandering or they are accusing or something of that nature, that's not your business. It's not, right? And it's not something that you have to fix because you never have to fix somebody else. Right? If you have a problem with somebody else's slander and the problem that you have with their slander is because of how it reflects upon you, then you've got a problem that needs to be fixed, right? <clears throat> because if you come at it from the right perspective and you see it the way that it really is, then you would recognize that the slander is their problem. The slander is their sin. The slander comes from their deception, and it's something that will destroy them, not you. And so your pity is for them. Your concern is for them. Your desire for uh, freedom is for them because they're the one that's bound, not you. Right? The world can, can condemn you, but as long as God approves of you, you can be disapproved by everyone as long as we have the right perspective. But when we don't have the right perspective and we think that we must control what others think and what they say and, and what they do and so on and so forth, now we have to get in a fight. We have to get into a fight with them. And we have to prove to prove others who are the watchers that, that we're right and they're wrong. And we have to prove to them that they're wrong and that we're right and so on. And it's just, it's a chaotic mess. You never have a responsibility for what somebody else thinks. You're never responsible for reputation, but you are responsible for influence. Influence is what you say and what you do. You're always responsible for that, but you're never responsible for what somebody else thinks, what they say, and what they do. So in that situation where somebody's slandering and other things like that, let, just leave it be. Live your life in Christ, and the example of your life and the consistency of your life will answer the accusations and the slander for those who are open to seeing the truth. And, uh, <clears throat> and you won't have to get into a holy war of words back and forth and trying to fix somebody else's perspectives and, and that kind of stuff. You can leave them with God. Um, all right, so here's another question. When God put them, Adam and Eve, 
out of the garden, did he not enter into Adam and Eve's spare, sphere? The answer is no, absolutely not. Um, if God would have, <laughs> how fast could this problem have been fixed if God would have just entered into their sphere? Well, it would have been a it would have been a pretty quick fix. God could just get in there. He could take the problem. He could fix it. He could resolve it. He could make sure the problem didn't develop in the first place. Sin could only arise where God had no access. Sin could only arise where God had no access. And God has no access in the self-government of an intelligent creature. Because he, because he created them to govern themselves. It's the only place that it could ever arise. And it only arises as a self-deception that causes us to take everything that God created and the way that he created us to function in the right direction and deceives us in thinking that the right direction, which is that way, is actually that way. And so we govern ourselves and direct ourselves in the wrong direction, thinking we're going in the right direction still. And it creates all sorts of chaos and havoc. And the whole plan of salvation is to try to <clears throat> help man to see the situation that he's in, the impossibility of him being able to fix the problem himself, to see the, the Savior and what the Savior has provided for us, and to then enter into a cooperative relationship with God where, like the armless mechanic, he gives the instruction, he gives the, uh, the ability to us, but we are the ones who does the work in order to um, resolve the problem that's inside. Right. <clears throat> Here's another question. Where does wife submit to your husband come into the explanation prior? Now, um, does it not show selfishness to do your half instead of meekly doing it all in love and as a rebuke to disorderly, uh, especially in the sense of a husband and wife? All right, let me take the first one and I'll answer that. Where does uh, wife submit yourself, submit your, submit to your husband? Uh, how does that, where does that fit in? All right, well, everyone there is authority, and there's only one source of authority, and that is God. That's God. That's it. There is no other source of authority. There's no other source of power. There's no other source of life. God is the source of it all. And so any authority that anybody has is simply delegated to them by God, right? And God delegated after the fall that the man was the head of the home, right? And what does that mean? Well, that means that in the context of selfishness and selfish uh, human nature, we will find ourselves with some divergent paths and divergent ideas and so on and so forth. And uh, since there's some divergent going on, different ideas, there had to be a tiebreaker. And essentially God said, okay, the husband is the tiebreaker. Now, that is in issues that don't relate to one's mor to morality and do not relate to one's personal responsibility to God. Okay. Um, so when it comes to my own personal responsibility to God, there is nobody, absolutely nobody, that can step in between. I have a personal responsibility to God for what I think, what I say, what I do, how I live, and so on. That's it. And so if I have a spouse, let's say I was the wife and then my husband, and my husband is the head of the home, and uh, what's my responsibility as the wife? My responsibility as the wife is to take everything that I need from God so that I'm full of his love, of his respect, of his honor, of his, his mercy, of his, you know, everything, his righteousness and his truth and so on, and then to give that freely to my husband. Right. I'm taking the part of the wife. Uh, so then I'm, I'm freely to give that to my spouse. Right. Um, and and do I have a responsibility for how they take that? No, none whatsoever. That's their own responsibility. Do I have a responsibility to control them? No, 
Do I have a responsibility to control how they think and, and other stuff like that? No, not absolutely not. And do they have that responsibility in return? No, absolutely not. So a husband's role is to be an under shepherd of the great shepherd, to love, to lead by example, to, um, you know, and to, and to so on, but it's not to drive. It's not to force none of that because that's not like God. And so as a wife, um, <clears throat> you submit to your husband to the degree that your husband is in harmony with God and God's will and his word. If your husband goes out of harmony with God's will and God's word, then you have no responsibility to follow your husband in that or to submit to him in that, because as the husband takes that authority and goes against God's will and God's way, now it's a usurped authority. It is not a delegated authority anymore, and you have no responsibility to respond to or obey a usurped authority that goes against God's will, none whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, I'll stop there. Um, does it show selfish, selfishness to just do your half of the cleaning of the house and, and, and so on and meekly do it in love as a rebuke to their orderliness, their disorderliness, uh, especially when you're talking about a uh, husband and wife? Well, can you do that with selfishness? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Selfishness can clean half of the house. And selfishness can clean half of the house with the idea of rebuking them and, and trying to prod them and trying to, so you can use that as a means to try to coerce them or force them or manipulate them into being in a similar way. And if you do so, yeah, it's selfishness. Is it going to work out well? Mm -mm, not going to work out well. Are you going to be happy in the process and content with your situation? Uh-uh. You're going to be frustrated up one side and down the other. And the longer you do it and the longer they don't respond, the more angry and frustrated you're going to get. And finally, you're going to blow your top. And you're going to have to try to control them some other way. It's not going to work if you have the wrong motive. But if you belong to God, and you know him and you love him and he's your source and you come to him and you take freely from him and you have his love and his mercy and his grace and, and so on and so forth and his patience and forbearance and so on. Then you can you can be in that relationship with him and you can be whistling and happy and singing hymns and other things of that nature while you're about your work and you can leave them alone and, you know, leave them to their whatever and you can pray for them and you can intercede on their behalf and desire their best good. And if they start coming around and showing, you know, improvements here or there, then you're you're happy for them because that's that's good for them. And and you know, you encourage them along and so on, not to manipulate them, but to simply be an encouragement for them. And and if they don't ever come along, well, you have your source and you're content in whatever situation that you're in. And, and you're cheerful anyways, because you've got God and he's good for you. And you don't have to be controlled and manipulated and miserable along the whole way. When it's the right, when it's the right um, motive. Right. How do you suggest navigating boundaries for live-in in-laws that are appropriate, kind and firm? All right, so you've got in-laws that are in the home, and, uh, and they're there. All right, so what are the purpose of the boundaries? What boundaries are you, are you thinking of? And uh, is it to protect you? Is it to protect God's mission? for your life. If, it, if it's for God's mission for your life, then it'll be clear what boundaries that you need to set uh, that need to be there in order to protect that mission, because you'll know the situations where it gets into interfering with, uh, you know, God's mission for your life. Are you looking at putting up boundaries because you don't like what they say and what they do and how they do things and, and so on and so forth? Well, that's, that's, that, that's your problem with their problem. Um, for example, I'll give you an example because we're, we have that situation on our own home. My father lives in the house with us and, um, and he, uh, he does not understand, he does not harmonize with us 
in regards to the management of the home and the property and other things of that nature. And so uh, typically when we are gone on a trip, we will come home and we're interested to find out what surprises are there. <laughs> because we don't know what he was, what while we were gone, what he would burn, what he would throw away, uh, what he would clean up that we didn't actually want him to clean up, what he, you know, he, he, he's got ideas of, of how to do that. And, and um, for, for many years, because he's lived with us for many years, for many years, it has been a, a, a plentiful source of uh, frustration up one side and down the other for my wife and I, until I started learning these principles. And then I realized, oh, hang on, you know what? It, it, the house is not mine. The yard is not mine. The, the, the forest is not, I mean, if he burns it down, well, that's, that's not good, but you know, he, he did it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lighting fires when it's windy and dry and and lots of leaves around and other things of that nature, you know, unsafe stuff. But I have no responsibility for his stewardship, none whatsoever. And I don't, I don't place, it's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. And I don't have a responsibility for how it turns out. So if there's something that I liked it this way, but it got all destroyed and taken away and all that kind of stuff, I simply look at the Lord and I go, okay, Lord, all right, that he did it, you know? I mean, there's going to be a day where he's he won't be able to mobilize. He'll either be dead or he'll be bedridden or other things like that. And these particular challenges that we have, we won't have those particular challenges anymore. There'll be other ones and, you know, and so on. And uh, But I don't have a responsibility for his stewardship. So I don't have to take responsibility for the things that he does. Even if we, you know, we do ask him from time to time, but, you know, leave that alone. That'd be nice and, and whatever. And if he goes and he does something with it, we ask him not to because we're gone and he has the advantage of doing it. Then, okay. Well, he has a responsibility to God for the things that he does, not to me. And so I don't have to stress about it. And I can be like, okay, well, that's dad. I don't have the authority as the son in this situation to control the actions and movements and that kind of stuff of, of my father. You know, I don't. So, okay, well, we, we let it go. Now, can there be situations where there is um, somebody takes their sphere of action, they get into other people's sphere of action in the home. And then, uh, you know, especially like with children, because we have children, we got five in the home still, six, yeah, five in the home still. And, uh, you know, and then could that be a, a problem? Well, yes, it, it could. And is it appropriate to have boundaries in order to protect others? Well, yes, it is. I wouldn't put up a boundary to protect myself, but it would, could be appropriate as the father of the home to have boundaries to protect the children. And, and that can be perfectly appropriate as well, because that's part of the, the, the job or the responsibility that God has given to me. And I have, a, I have a delegated authority from the Lord. So I would come to him and I'd go, okay, Lord, in this situation, it's your delegated authority. These are, this, these are your children, both grandpa and the children. And so how would you have me to, to cooperate with you in the situation for you to work this out your will and your way? And so the stress is not on me. God knows how he's going to figure it out. He's got everybody's hearts in his hands. I, my, my position is simply, Lord, what would you have me to do right now in the midst of this? Um, Jan, you've got your hand up. So as you are describing these principles, these new principles, uh, life-changing principles, hard principles, <laughs> new principles, <laughs> Um, when you learn these things, I mean, it takes a while for the mind to even process it and, right. and uh, learn how to even apply it. But um, can you kind of give an example of like, like a scenario, like when you're in a situation, are you actually talking to the Lord through the process or... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a lot to take in. It's, it's, it's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, that's, I mean, I'm, I understand that I'm presenting to individuals a concept that I have been learning for time, right? It's been a while that I have been learning this concept and looking at applying it and understanding it. And I recognize others are just not there, you know? Um, and so this is like, wow, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's like, could life actually even be like that? Is that realistic? Well, that's the thing about salvation is it provides everything that we don't have. If it's something that you and I can come up with and we can actually make it happen, then it's not something that will save us because we can't do anything that will save us. And so, uh, yes, I'm, you know, when I'm in a situation of that nature, I'm talking to God. Um, you know, a lot of <laughs> a number of the things that I discover after we get back from trips uh, are usually out in the yard somewhere. And I usually have my my morning walk time, talk times with the Lord in the early morning. And so the sun might be rising and I'm starting to see things and I might see trees missing or, you know, other things of that nature. And so me and God are talking already and I'm like, oh, Lord, all right, that one went, didn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Well, you knew about it, didn't you? You know, you knew he was doing it. You gave him life while he was doing it. You know, we asked him not to, and okay, well, you know, he did it. And so, Lord, his, you know, his responsibility is, is between you and him. And, and, uh, and Lord, I need your heart of love for him that I can love him with your, with, you know, with your love. Because, you know, if it was mine, I would just be frustrated and want to wring his neck and kick him out of the house, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and so on. I not necessarily to that degree, but if it was just self, you know, then yeah, I, I could get really frustrated and, and, uh, you know, I want to eject him. Of course, I'd want to eject some of the children as well. And in fact, if I had my way and I followed my way, I would eject everybody around me at some point because that's just what selfishness does. And, um, and so, yes, a lot of talking with the Lord. Uh, many times it's a situation where I get frustrated or sometimes I'll even blow up uh, about it. And then me and God have to talk about it later. And I realize, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. You know, I, you know me blowing up, me getting frustrated shows that it's my problem. And that's my problem that needs to be dealt with. And when my problem is dealt with, I won't have a problem with his problems. Now, it doesn't mean that he won't have problems anymore, but I just won't have problems with it. And so, all right, Lord, you and I, let's work on this <laughs> so, so, that, so that I don't have a problem with that <laughs> out there anymore. Yeah, and so, yeah, there is a lot of there is a lot of talk between me and God, and and you know, a lot of times there's falling down, messing up, not getting it right, uh, apologizing. Um, and so on and and you know and sometimes it's stuff that's come out in public you know in the home and so it's something that i need to apologize publicly in the home and and so on yeah all right uh here's a question i understand that protecting ourselves is taking god's responsibility over us but how do we protect ourselves from abusive physically emotionally financial verbal husband um so you're not your own, right? So you come to God and you go, okay, God, I don't belong to me. He doesn't belong to me. We don't belong to each other. Each of us belongs to you. And there's a commitment to, to remaining with you while we're with each other, right? And, uh, and so, Lord, what would you have me to do in this situation? Right? Because it's not my body that's getting beat up, it's your body. And it's not my mind, it's your mind. And you know the situation, you know his heart, you know my heart, and so on. So what would you have me to do? And, and so, uh, you know, and then following, the, following what, the, what the Lord would have you to do. Uh, <clears throat> do you have the right yourself to decide to get out because you don't like it? The answer is no, you don't. Do you have the right yourself to stay in? No, you don't. You don't have either right. You don't have any right yourself to either jump out because you don't like it or stay in it. 
your responsibility as a steward is simply to come to God and say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then you follow his direction and his instruction in your life. And, and can love allow itself to be in a situation where love, where I will be harmed for the good of someone else? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, look at Jesus <laughs> and look at the martyrs and, and so on. Yes, absolutely. It, it, it will. Love, love can do that and love will do that. But I don't have <clears throat> the, what should I say? I'm not the under owner of my life. I'm only the steward of it. It's God's life. And so I need to come to him and I need to ask him and I need to follow his instruction and his leading in my life in the moment to know what he would have me to do in this situation, whether that is staying or whether that is going, whether that is addressing an issue or not addressing an issue. It needs to be under his direction. And, and he knows how to do that well. We don't. That's why we come to God with our lack of wisdom. And he says, come to me. Uh, and, uh, well, all you who are heavy, weary and heavy burden, but he also says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives liberally and without finding fault. You can come to him. He wants to listen to you. He, he is listening to you. He wants to, you know, enter into that with you, and he wants you, he wants to teach you how to understand his will in the moment to moment. <clears throat> Another question, how would I view in a biblical way a guest <clears throat> or a brother in the church who each time they are over, they do something we requested they not do? That's like my father. Uh, such as enter a room we asked um, publicly that they not enter, yet they did so publicly, promptly after being asked not to, or leave those gathered for Bible study to walk the property on his own. The individual lets his children run free without management, yet tries to constantly correct our children, not sure how to view this relationship. Okay, right. So, well, it's not your home. It's not your property. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, you know, and can you control them? No, you can't control them. And same, again, the same principle comes back. It's, Lord, what would you have me to do? This is, this is not my property. It's your property. It's not my family, it's your family. And so what would you have me to do in relation to uh, this? Uh, you know, is this a situation where, where they just need to not be invited over in the future? Is that something that you want, Lord? Or is it something where you need to teach me something when they come over and they do these things because it's still in my heart and it needs to be worked out? And their coming over is a is a signal of how we're doing in that process of, of, you know, heart transformation. So that's something you bring before the Lord and you, and you follow in his way. Right. Um, <clears throat> here's another one. Don't know if anyone has asked this yet, but as a parent of a young child, how do you parent without being controlling, manipulating, or being toxic? How can you make sure you're not crossing the line and behaving that way. How do you recognize and stop that behavior? Okay, so the, the usual problem that parents have is that we try to prevent the children from doing evil and being evil. And we try to threaten them that if they do evil, then we will do this, that, or the other. Uh, and so we end up threatening and we end up trying to prevent the evil. And then when the evil is done, we're very inconsistent about bringing consequences for the evil. If you want to put a cigarette in your mouth and smoke it, you've got all the freedom from God to do so. You got free. He, he'll tap you on the shoulder. He'll tell you, no, no, don't do that. It's not good for you. He'll, he'll, you know, he'll speak to your conscience while you're doing so, but he, he but you still have his power to do so. And you can smoke it and you can smoke the next one and the next one and the next one, 10,000 and a hundred thousand cigarettes. You can smoke them. You got the freedom to do so. God will never control what you think and what you believe and what you want to do. But 
You can't smoke that cigarette without getting the consequences of having done so. You can't. There's no choice for that. So what God does with his children is he doesn't prevent them from doing the evil. He will instruct. He will warn by example, others' examples, and so on. He will, he will uh, you know, he'll warn you that no, that's not a good thing. Don't go there. <laughs> you know, you don't want to go there. But he doesn't, you know, and, and so, so he'll, he'll do that, but he won't keep you from doing the evil. But guess what? When you do the evil, you get the consequences. And that's how God trains his children. And when we learn that with our children, then that really helps things out. So what do you do? Well, you don't prevent them from doing the evil. Now, if they don't have the capacity to understand what they're doing, you know, you've got a, you've got a 12-month-old that's just learning how to walk, and you've got a stairway, a wooden stairway that goes all the way down to the basement, you know. Um, well, you would put up a baby gate. Right? That's appropriate because they they can't comprehend what they're doing. They don't have the capacity to, you know, to understand the situation that they're in. And so you do protective things for them in that context. But to have the baby gate there for a 13-year-old, uh-uh, mm -mm. not appropriate. Right? So according to their capacity, you give them the freedom to 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 do things. But you're consistent, consistent, consistent with the consequences of it. Right? And the consequences need to be uh, consistent, and they need to be graded as well. It's like gravity. You know, you, you jump off of one step, hey, you have a little landing. You jump off two steps, the eh, landing's a little harder. Jump off of five steps, the eh, landing's a bit harder. Jump off the roof, landing's a lot harder, right? So the harder the offense the harder the consequences associated with it. And then they learn. And if it's consistent like that, well, you know, there's no child that goes out there and go gets on the second floor, the roof on a two, two floor, two floor, two story building and goes, oh, yeah, let's see what it's like to land here. No, because they had consistent consequences from previous experiences in smaller situations so that they look at this and they can calculate it and then go, oh, this is not going to end up well at all. Mm -mm, no, I'm not going there. I'm not even trying that one. Right. So, and, you know, the consequences, are they given in frustration or what? No, it's because you love them. Right. So consistent consequences, graded, right? The, the, if, they're, if they're pushing it, and, uh, you know, they want to push that rebellion farther. Okay, the consequences get hotter. And they push it harder, then the consequences get hotter. And, you know, progressively so, so that they get the idea that if they continue heading in this rebellion direction, it's just going to get hard for them. And it's just not going to work out well. I don't want to go there. Right? And those consequences will never change the heart. It's like the civil law. What it does is it, 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 it helps the, the child to control their behavior. So it, it helps an individual to be civil if they won't be moral. But while you're doing it, you love them. You assure them of God's love for them. You, 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 know, you offer them to you know forgiveness in their acknowledging their wrong and all that kind of stuff and you know and you surround them with love it's the love that will convert their hearts it's the consequences that will divert them from pursuing the evil and it's a combination of the two that's necessary in the parenting in order for that to work out well yeah. um all right, so in the case of the elderly parent living in the home, when it comes to the safety of others and their own safety, is there never a place for a role reversal? And you exercising the leadership role, you've been delegated over your own house and household. When God has given us stewardship over something, whether our pets or home or possessions in a broad sense, aren't we responsible to God for the use and the outcome we make of them? Yes, we are, but we're not responsible for the use that others make of them. Uh, if the thief comes in and steals it, well, that's their responsibility, not yours. Um, and um, but with the elderly parent, yes, there there does come a point, and uh, you know, especially in the context of of um, dementia and the progression of dementia, where uh, 
you you start getting to that point where an individual, a parent figure, and not reason through and comprehend what they're doing, right? So they start losing the ability to reason um, because of the progression of the dementia. And in that case, there are there's the need, just like with the, the 12 month old that's learning to walk with baby gates, you know, there's there's certain protections that are necessary in regards to the capacity of the individual. Then similarly, as the child who's the, you know, the middle generation in this multi-generational home, the child now starts taking more of a parental role over the parent who's now becoming more childlike in their ability to think and reason. And, uh, and yes, it's reasonable to put certain protections that are in there for their sake, for their good. Um, and so on. Uh, will they protest with some of these things? Yes, they probably will. Um, <clears throat> if you're coming at it from the right perspective, you're not going to take it personal. It's not going to be stressful, but you're still always looking for, all right, what's the balance? You know, what's the balance here? How much capacity do they have? What do they not have? How do I need to relate to them within the context of that capacity? And that's not an easy, it's not something that's really easy to, to understand. And so it, it's, again, another situation where we come to God and we go, okay, God, you know their capacity capacity and you know so what would you have me to do in relation to them right now um <clears throat> all right so another question how do you deal with government regulations such as registering your sim card to keep track of the mobile activities of its citizens um well okay it's it's you know, um, you can relate to that a number of different ways. You can either not have a SIM card, uh, not have a cell phone. I mean, that's a privilege, not something that you necessarily have to have. I mean, you think, you think about it in life nowadays and we're like, oh, no, how can you live without it? Well, we live for thousands of years without them. Um, but, uh, you know, if if there are certain things in your possession and the government wants to, you know, track and follow and whatever, well, that's their responsibility. Um, if you want to use those devices while they're tracking it, then well, that's your responsibility. And, uh, and, you know, you can trust that, okay, you can go to God and say, okay, God, do you want me to use this device now? They're tracking it and God might be like, yeah, sure. That's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm, I got it taken care of. Or, or you go to God and you're like, they're, they're tracking this stuff. And, you know, and God might be like, well, it's a good time for you to cut off that cell phone thing because it's been an issue between you and I. And this is a good reason to do so, um, you know. But it's it's under God's God's uh, direction. Um, all right, here's a question: <clears throat> How do boundaries work with ex-husbands or ex-wives? Um, if both parties remain unmarried. Is it healthy to keep the ex-husband or father of the children as the head of the home if he still wants that role? How do we work out different ideas of education for the children? <clears throat> How can we keep some order <clears throat> for the sake of the children in a less than perfect family? Is it healthy to yield to the father in regards to child rearing decisions? When should one draw the line? Okay. So we'll go back to the discussion that we had previously in regards to husband and wife and submitting to the husband. Um, the submission is not just for wives to husbands, it's submission for everybody to everybody, really. It's submit yourselves one to another as unto the Lord, and that's a, that's a key principle. Now, it, the, the roles might be parent-child, it might be husband-wife, it might be uh, supervisor, supervisee, it might be, you know, a number of different things, but it all, it all comes down to the same principles. Are they governing <clears throat> consistent with God's law and God's will? If they are governing consistent with God's law and God's will, and there is some measure of structure from that standpoint, you know, boss, employee, parent, child, so on. If there's some, some measure of structure, then you submit yourself to their government 
citizen. You, you submit yourself to their rules and regulations that are not out of harmony with God's will and God's way. The moment that their rules and regulations or what they require, what they want goes outside of God's will and God's way, you have no responsibility to continue following in that direction. In fact, your responsibility is to not do so because your responsibility is to God. Right? And, um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, so, so, so married or unmarried, there's, there's still a father, mother relationship in as far as the family is concerned right and, and so uh <clears throat> in the right perspective can you have a cooperative relationship that is uh that is working well and, and so on and so forth well actually under the right circumstances with the right harmony and everything like that you get married again Right. <clears throat> because both of you were under Christ, both of you are, you know, seeking his will and way, um, you know, uh, and both of you are changing, being transformed and, and so on. And you can come together in a selfless manner because both of you are taking from God and you can continue managing the home and the children and, and all that kind of stuff in that context. Um, and uh you know, but you have to individually assess things based upon the word of God and say, okay, would I would I submit to this or not? Now, where does the tiebreaker thing come in? The tiebreaker thing comes in where it's not a moral issue, right? where it's not a moral issue. So, for example, <clears throat> should the children wear that color clothing or this color clothing for the day? You know, for the baby. You know, do we do we dress the baby in this color or that color? Well. If wife says, I want pink, if husband says, I want maroon, then, and, you know, there's whatever, then the tiebreaker would be the husband and it would be maroon, right? And, you know, it's, it's a non-issue, right? It's really a non-issue. But when it comes to, um, you know, do we, do we go here and break God's commandments? Do we not go here and break God's commandments? And you as the wife don't want to break God's commandments and the husband wants to, well, then there's no submission there anymore because you submit to God and you keep his commandments. So it's in the non-moral, uh, you know, types of issues and so on, where there's kind of the timebreaker thing going on between husband and wife. Hmm. All right. Um, yes. Those who share children, but never, never married, same principles really a, a apply um uh, how do you view civil rights movements through the law of life right through this this context or this uh so so in christ we would always stand up for the rights of others we would we would we would always stand up for the rights of others, even but you don't stand up for your own rights, your own personal rights. But you do have a a mission that God has given to you, and you stand up for the rights of that mission, right? Um, <clears throat> so if you have others that are being oppressed, <clears throat> excuse me, it's time for a drink. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you are having others that are being oppressed and <clears throat> oppressed, um, uh, of course, out of harmony with God's God's will, God's word, then you would seek to stand up for their rights. Now, you would not seek to stand up their, for their rights by taking away somebody else's rights. That would be inconsistent. It would be inconsistent. It just <clears throat> no. But you stand up for and you promote them being able to have those <clears throat> civil rights and those civil liberties that you desire for yourself as well, and you desire for everyone else too. If it is a right that you desire for somebody, but you can't give that right to everybody, then question whether that is a fundamental right or not. So it should, those rights that we should be fighting for and looking for from a civil rights standpoint are rights that everybody in a group should have. 
and it's fundamental throughout uh, <clears throat> throughout an entire group. And those are just a few thoughts, but there's a lot. I mean, I'm sure we could put a whole presentation together on on that in and of itself. Okay, I think we covered a lot of territory. It's a lot to think about. We are going to put this on our YouTube channel. We're away from home, so it's probably not going to be until eh, Thursday evening, Friday, <clears throat> before we get it up on the on the uh, YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, do so, you know, because once we put out new videos and so on, then it'll be there. It's New Paradigm Ministries. Paradigm is P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M, <laughs> right? And uh, you just go to YouTube and type in New Paradigm Ministries, and it's there. You can you can uh, subscribe, and uh, and then you know the videos that are going out on a weekly basis will be updated when it's there and available, and so on. And if you've got more questions, go ahead and email them. That's that's good. And if you want to. Um, if you want to uh, receive more, um, you know, like kind of like a weekly reminder of these counseling, uh, these group sessions, then uh, email us at info at npmen.org. That's info at npmen.org. I just threw that in the chat and uh, let us know that you want to be, because I don't want to, there's a lot of people on the mailing list that don't necessarily want to be hit every week. And um, so I want to preserve that. But those that want it, then we'll send it out to them. All right, well, let's pray. And uh, and let's look at applying these things in our lives. It'll be sketchy at the beginning. It will be. It won't be perfect at the beginning. Expect it. You're going to mess up. You'll fall on your face. You know, get these things wrong. You'll get frustrated, upset, get in somebody else's sphere of action and so on, or let them get into yours and be controlled and so on. Okay, All right. recognize it. And then, you know, and then you come back and you get back up. And you, you know, every time you fall, you get back up and the Lord will work with you. And over time, it will get better. It won't be so hard. It will be easier. It will come more naturally. And, and life will start being more free, more free. You know? And that's what we want. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, so much for being such an awesome God. And uh, Lord, thank you for these, these principles, these simple principles, sphere of action and boundaries and so on. And uh, Lord, as we take those principles and we look at applying them in our lives, uh, we just ask for you to work mightily and abundantly, help us in the process as we fall flat on our face. That's okay. Your hand is there to lift us up and encourage us to get along and uh, to continue on. And may we find greater and greater freedom in Christ in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>